Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. You all knew Ben Dulu very well. He was a brilliant public servant, a brilliant scholar, and a brilliant friend to almost everybody who's with us here today. He served as governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania for 10 years, and since 2018, we've been thrilled to have him here at the Blavatnik School as a professor, as a visiting professor and senior advisor to Digital Pathways, our research program on the governance of digital technologies. Benno was passionately committed to digitalization as a solution for the poorest countries, finally, to be able to make the advances their populations so needed. Just before we lost Benno, he'd been about to present this, his latest paper at a public seminar here at the Blavatnik School. It's an important work on how to tax digital systems across Africa. He was immensely excited by the policy implications of it and to honor his wish that this work be widely disseminated. We're hosting this event here today to discuss the paper. I'm joined by Stefan Dercon, Professor of Economic Policy here at the school and the academic co-director of the Digital Pathways Program. We're also delighted to have with us Cornell Joseph, a lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam and one of Benno's co-authors on this paper. And I know for all the scholars present, you'll know just how selective Benno was about who he chose to co-author with. So we're particularly thrilled to have you here with us today, Cornell. And of course, for Benno as the first holder of the Julius Nyerere Chair of Economics there, the University of Dar held a very special place in his heart. Stefan and Cornell, thank you so much for being with us here today. We're delighted to have so many of Benno's friends in the audience. In particular, I want to say a warm welcome to Ambassador Ami Mpungwe, one of Professor Ndulu's closest friends in Tanzania, and who's also representing the family at today's seminar. Stefan, I'm going to pass over to you for some of the context and policy implications of the paper, and Cornell will present the analysis. So Stefan Dercon. Thank you very much, Nairi. I, I won't be able to do justice to, to Benno, not just in the content of the paper, but also in the, the way he would present it. Probably um, speaking softly, determined that you had to listen carefully, but always to the point and making you think about why something is important and why we should listen and take seriously the arguments he made. This is work that reflected very much how Benno wanted to think about the world. He was passionate about, um, passionate about digitalization, the opportunities from digital finance, but he was realistic enough that he was also advising governments that were scrambling for revenue flows and to get new resources. He knew that if we couldn't resolve issues to do with how to tax digital goods. And if by avoiding this kind of discussion, you wouldn't really be able to move forward further into this space. Of course, it's a dilemma, and maybe we can go to the slides now. Um, it is a dilemma of how you're going to do taxation and how you're going to do that in a way so that innovation is not being stifled. It's an easy thing to say, oh, well, if you do taxation for innovation, let's then basically do zero tax on any form of innovation, anything new, and then we're fine. Of course, that's not a reality of policymaking. You need to solve today to have a tomorrow as well. You need to be able to do things today in a way that you can build the future, but today's constraints matter a lot. We can go to the next slide. And so the context is really is that Benno passionately believed that digitalization was really the key issue that he wanted to, to, uh, to think about. And it's this growth perspective that was the essence that was behind it. And at the same time, we really have a problem with how many people are being reached. You know, there's not enough people being reached, there's a big urban rural divide. And in particular, also during the pandemic, it became clear that if we wanted to reach anyone, for example, with mobile money transfers, the most needy were very hard to, uh, to, to reach. So next slide, please. So 
So the argument really is, is that there is this really big dilemma that we need to be able to resolve. So if we want to promote digitalization, taxation shouldn't be a hindrance. At the same time, we do need more revenue. And of course, the big particular problem with digital services is the complica complicated nature of how to try to tax it. So while it's obvious that you could say, oh, well, let's put on some other transactions tax, let's try to tax these goods and the services quickly. And surely, indeed, some of the operating companies seem to be making quite a lot of, of, um, of, of, uh, of profit. But it's really a complex set of goods to tax. First of all, because these, the intangibility of, uh, of the good itself, and also because a lot of the operators, especially in the space of digital services and the internet, um, the money is um, made by multinational digital companies. And as we know, in every country in the world, it is a real big issue. Now, the challenge there is, we need to have these kind of activities grow in these countries. We need to be able to encourage them to be there, but we do need revenue. Um, and at the same time also, we can't just tax these commodities because they will affect, or these services, because, because also they will affect very strongly internet access in this respect. And that's the kind of the thing that the paper wants to do. How do I actually try to take the issue of taxation forward, taking into account these are complicated services tax, clearly profit taxation or other forms of taxation clearly have to be on the radar. A lot of profits are being made. But meanwhile, we need to strongly encourage the further spread to actually in the long term have a far broader uses of these services. So the paper is really just about how to actually do this. And maybe the the key um, findings of the paper are, and I think we can go to the, no, uh, we can go to the next slide, yes, is that the key finding that, or the key arguments is that will, and, and, and Cornell will talk in a moment more about it, is that to think carefully about the distortionary, discriminatory, and possibly regressive nature of this taxation, and to actually try to find the balance. So let me hand over to Cornell to actually talk a little bit more about the analysis, and then I'll come back to give a sense of the of the kind of conclusions and policy implication that uh, that Benno was trying to promote. Cornell, over to you. Okay, the intention of this paper is generally, first of all, we measured the internet use as a measure of the physical, of a measure of the internet, ad internet adoption has been used one as a measure of digital transformation in sub-Saharan Africa. That is what we used in measure in the digital transformation. And our papers has two, had two main contributions. And the first one, we systematically identified and confirmed the relative importance of key enablers of digitalization in sub-Saharan Africa by believing that this has not been done anywhere, therefore could contribute as a new field or a new contribution for the start. Also, after that one, the second contribution of the papers, we analyzed the impact of the taxes, which is user tax, producer tax, and investment taxes on relative enablers as a trans transmission mechanism or transmission channel on the internet use. When, based on the first uh, ideas, we identify the two main enablers, internet enablers in sub-Saharan Africans, where we identify that there is connectivity enablers. Under these connectivities, what we are saying, others they could say is the supply factors which contribute to the internet use. And under this, we identify the case like the having the in, the mobile mobile phone ownership access to electricity and the internet coverage and the second group of the enablers which used in these studies we use the user capabilities in terms of affordabilities 
which could be measured in terms of, for instance, income, monthly income, and also the price of the digital services. Therefore, based on the second objective, which we said we analyze the impact of taxes on the digital use, we identify it through the channel. We assume that the tax affect the internet use through these key two key enablers. It means, for instance, when the, you, raise, you, reduce, you raise the tax on the investment, you could raise the cost for, for investors to own your infrastructures, Finally, you find that the network coverage is reduced and the internet use may be affected. Or when you raise the price on, we raise the tax on the price of the goods you, on the internet, you find that the, the, the affordability is affected, people they cannot afford it, and the user has a result, you find that the internet uses usage is reduced. Therefore, our analysis was based on the panel data for 40 sub-Saharan African countries over six years, 2014 to 2019. And our main result, which we found from this best objective, we found that internet coverage and ownership of mobile handsets together have the largest contribution in explaining the low level of internet use in sub-Saharan Africa. And the, the, therefore, the tax should be taken when we impose the tax, whatever the policymakers impose the tax should take into account this, that once we impose the tax, for instance, on the infrastructures, could harm the network coverage and the result could end up with the low internet usage. And the second objective, we look on the int tax, the impact of tax on this digitalization through the transmission mechanism indirectly through the transmission. And under this, we observed, for instance, a 10% 10 redu 10 reduction on tax on internet usage through price would raise the 3.1% increase in people using the internet. And the other find through the tax we observe, for instance, 10% reduction on tax rates charged at the total cost of mobile ownership could also increase a 8.5% of internet usage in sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, in general, just a minor conclusion which we made from there that the government, once imposed tax, should weigh the short-term revenue which it wants to capture and the long-term long-term prevent long-term consequences of this tax on the digital transformation in sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, based on that one, this is one which raised us to generalize the policy implication which in a few seconds, Ms. Dr. Stefan will take us through the policy implication of these studies. And those policy implications has been derived from this just summary of the finding which I have been presented. Now, Stefan, you may take through the policy implication of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Cornell. And it's, um, it's really, interesting and you know the paper is now also on the website um is on the website of this talk um and it's really worth looking at further because it's one of these ways that benno would not just take some statistical analysis and then draw very quickly the policy implication there's actually quite a lot of rich basic data analysis that he added to the paper together with cornell um and simply to to begin to show that not only is the taxation and the pricing of both on mobile phones and on uses of internet, we having an impact on the, sp on the, um, the speed of digitalization, but also that relative to other sectors, this is now a sector that is so overtaxed relative to other sectors that just we have here a sector where we know and where Benno deeply believed from what he had seen and experienced, it could have a huge impact on people's lives through digital finance, or also as a source of growth and productivity growth in the, in going in, into the future for, the, uh, for, uh, for Africa. 
and in terms of the innovation and the new firms and the business could be doing. Now, the, the paper documents very much that this taxation is not just having a, you know, an income and a price effect, uh, an impact on through the ownership and the pricing of ownership and the pricing of the servicing. We could say, well, look, that's with any commodity, always there will be some distortion. But it's the degree of overtaxation in this sector where, for example, certain, certain investment goods uh, were taxed by more than 50%, where profit taxation takes different levels uh, than relative to other firms that he actually wanted to highlight. And so this is what he, he wanted to, uh, in the final parts of this paper, emphasize on the policy implication. Surely you need to think of revenue collection. There's no one on this call that will say, we don't need to get towards more co revenue collection and digital goods should be part of that. But the short and, and the long-term objectives need to be carefully balanced here. And the problem now is that um, the sector-specific taxation policies, they are heavily distortionary, in particular 3G and electricity taxation, um, or the investment goods related to 3G and to, uh, for example, key enablers here, they tend to be actually very heavily, heavily taxed. Secondly, the ownership of handsets, where you have taxation rates for consumer goods that are far more than many other uh, goods. And it's treated as if it's just a luxury, while Ben clearly wants to argue, look, this is not anymore a luxury. This is a key source of financial inclusion, of general inclusion in your society. And furthermore, and linked to that, this taxation is highly regressive. Um, the, it's a very strongly regressive in the way the taxation structures are, are being done. And this is then where he wanted to come to the kind of more positive uh, ideas about it. Because as Cornell showed in the analysis, in the econometric analysis in the paper, this pricing, and we more and more we see across Africa, that we have the data to begin to start saying, well, this pricing and these cost of these services, they will matter for digitalization. So how do we now think of an appropriate taxation system? So Ben very strongly in the final part, and I really encourage you to have a careful look at it. He basically says, well, we must remove, first of all, these distortions, we, and which he calls actually discriminatory taxation, for example, relative to handsets. It is so fundamental that people must get start getting access to these goods, that the investment can be made and that it is far less distortionary as it is. So he wanted to eliminate across the value chain, all these distortionary um, sector specific uh, taxation um, policies. And then furthermore, he wanted to be progressive. And it's an interesting idea that he has there is that he's not just talking about, um, well, he's talking about progressive taxation, but actually all the way using subsidies and, and other structures to get there. In fact, he was using the term freemium pricing, you know, where, which is a typical thing in digital goods where a basic package is good, you know, is, sorry, it's for free. Think of any app that you download from the Apple store, and then you have additional services you can purchase. He wanted to do the basic access to internet to start getting that structure where the basic access would be free with a premium pricing system. And indeed taxation should encourage them. So he talks about freemium taxation, which is a really neat idea to capture it. So I'm going to stop now and I'm sure we uh, could have uh, more discussion about it. And Cornell I'm sure is available to explain more of the analysis. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for a terrific um, presentation of, of the arguments. It's, it's classic Ben Ondru work to take the question which matters most in this area, to ask what are the likely drivers, to interrogate the best available ev evidence, and then to draw out these kind of really relevant practical policy implications. Now, usually in an academic um, seminar, we would invite you all to ask questions um, 
critiques, etc. And I, you're certainly most welcome to do this and we would invite you to use the question and answer uh, tag at the bottom of your screen. Um, but equally, I think uh, Stefan, Cornell, uh, Elizabeth Stewart, who's, who's with us and has been um, administering and leading the Digital Pathways uh, work from within the school, they would love to hear from you about how you think this paper could best be used or how you think the arguments in the paper could best be strengthened. We would love to use this um, memorial seminar to really um, crowdsource and enhance the work that, that it has sparked. So please do feel free to, to either type your questions or comments in um, or to um, ra raise your hand in the, in the question and answer at the bottom of your screen. So we have some questions here from Olesia Kochikova, who's asking, well, there's a lot in the question, but let me just pull out um, that she's asking about you know, whether you have any thoughts on the broader governance ecosystem for innovative infrastructure in the economy. I wonder, Stefan and Cornell, whether you had any comment on that. You're on mute, Stefan. Sorry. Um, well, um, it's, it's interesting with the work that I've been privileged to do over the last three years with Benno, around the, the work around digital pathways and earlier with the, with, with the commission, it became one of these things that um, Benno had a very clear, um, a clear sense and a clear passion is that an essential part of it um, had to do of course with the incentive setup. But the governance question that is being raised, he put always quite central, he was, one that pushed us to say, look, if we, if we want this to ever have an impact in a country, you do need early on find ways of getting the different potential agents of change together. That actually you start from the beginning to talk with government, but also understand what is the private sector potential here and not just assume that the government sets some rules and sets some taxation and some mm -hmm. things, but to have actually the dialogue from the beginning to quite mm -hmm. to understand it. Now, an interesting thing is at least in a particular country to start governing how mm -hmm. to get the right infrastructures, infra mm -hmm. investment there, also mm -hmm. the innovation structures. It then becomes also quite uh, local uh, country specific. You know, Benno was a strong believer in the ownership uh, of local um, local parties to actually get get something done. So it was uh, fascinating to go with Benno to Mongolia, where you end, we ended up talking there, say, oh, okay, what would it mean there? How what would it look like there? Or that we were engaging in. Um, in South Africa, which is already a very different setup with very different players in this space. And so rather than say, let's impose, which is so tempting, you know, even here as a governor of central bank to say, I'll just regulate for it. He looked for a model that actually could work within this con context. And it's not just the politics, but also who could be the operators, who could be the entrance. So rather than saying, I have a concrete idea of what the governance looks like, it's very clear that his ideas were always like, you know, Let's get the different groups together. Don't impose it, but actually start, don't get this idealized version, but let's get something pragmatically, how it can work here, and then we'll have a good basis to make some progress. Thank you, um, Stefan. And yes, you remind me, Benno's first lecture in the school on this really focused on, as he put it, the ecosystem within which private and public sector could flourish. But of course, another part of that ecosystem is the global. And so, Stephen, I'm sure everyone in this seminar um, is aware that you're moonlighting at present for the UK government. Um, and I wonder if you could give us just a very private look into what this looks like at the global level. You know, the, the British government is very involved in the G7 discussions on digital taxation and such like. And, and 
you know, this is a this is of course a, a private event. It'd be lovely to get your your glimpse into that world. No, no, thank you. And it's it, it's it, no, it's fascinating, and I'm I'm grateful for the for the question because it's look, we for for a while different G7 countries, and I will not count the UK within it, have been thinking about how to do this, but. Uh, of course, uh, we know of initiatives in France and so on and talk about it, but it felt as long as the US was not on board, there was very little possibility of conversation. Of course, Janet Yellen has given an opening recently, and it's a very clear sense that what we have now inside UK government also, that suddenly it can be discussed. So that's actually a constructive thing. And in fact, in the context of the G7 presidency of the UK, it's now become one of the main themes that the Chancellor Rishi Shunak is actually focusing on and to actually think how we actually make progress. And, and Stefan, for people concerned with Benno's concern, which is, you know, digital inclusion across Africa, what should we be looking for as the most important thing for the G7 to do? So the, um, well, I do think, I mean, he, you know, I. I'm, well, I can probably list a few, and I don't know which he would have said is the most important. He was very concerned with the lack of ownership of African countries in the whole discussion around. So digitalization and forms of digitalization feel imposed onto the continent as well. There is a, he was very concerned, and we talked about it in the last year occasionally, in the kind of geopolitics of it all, how it was going to be played out, because that's not really putting Africa first, but it's actually the fights between different models coming from the East or coming from the West. And it's something there, we didn't really have an answer. But, but in the end though, he was very much about, we just need to connect people and getting the infrastructure out, getting the access to the mobile phone, uh, for mobile phones out. And he actually goes back to also what he announced in the paper and he ends up focusing quite a lot on how do we get people to actually getting access? So, so he was, uh, he probably disagreed with me where I would have thought the first two I mentioned may be more important. I think in the end he said, let's get it done. You know, let's get it done, done and roll it out and more and more people make it irreversible. And, and probably I would have in the end agreed with him. Great, now we have a long time colleague um, of uh, Benno's in the audience who's got a question. And Sh Shanta Devarajan, um, I'd like you to just to ask you to come on camera to ask your question personally. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, no, it's very, very nice. And I'm, I'm really grateful for having this opportunity to commemorate uh, uh, Benno's uh, legacy uh, in, in this way. And thank you, Stefan. And Cornell for a very nice presentation of the paper. Uh, I, I, I had two questions, actually, one of which Nari had already asked, but the first one is simply the, what are the estimates of the revenue implications of these tax changes uh, in, in Africa? Because so, some of them are reductions in tax rates. And we know that sometimes when you reduce tax rates, you lose revenue. And whether there are compensating uh, measures to uh, keep revenue from declining. Uh, the, and the second question is actually, maybe I can build on Stefan's answer to Nairi's question, which is how can we better coordinate this, these tax proposals with the G7 efforts to try to harmonize taxation uh, across, uh, across countries? Uh, because there is a big issue I mean, that's sort of the big issue in the room is how can we get uh, uh, harmonization or ta coordination of taxation in different developed countries uh, of the same uh, uh, digital companies. Now, if there's some way in which this could be an input into that discussion, saying here, here are the, the African countries are making progress in their dimension, but this has to be part of the global coordination effort that could actually help move that process along. Thanks. Um, Shanta, just before you, you go, you know, you're a long term, uh, long time colleague of Benno's, but also you served as a commissioner on the Digital Pathways oh. Project. And I just wanted to know, um, wondered if you would like to leave us with a thought about Benno's contribution to that work. 
as oh as a whole. Yeah. Oh, I, I uh, Benno was the I don't know how to say it, but he, he was the lifeblood of that commission. Uh, I mean, we 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 were all we came in with very different uh, uh, backgrounds and perspectives, but Benno mm -hmm. would would fire us up at these commission meetings uh, with his passion, with his enthusiasm, and really bring us together. I mean, he brought very different perspectives. When you think about the people on the commission, Belinda Gates, Stripe, Masiwa, and so on. But he brought us together with a common mission. Uh, and I will always be grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Shanta. Um, for both the question and the and the comment. Can I ask Cornell and Stefan whether either of you would like to comment on Shanta's question? Cornell? Okay, may, okay. maybe I could respond to the first question. We didn't estimate the revenue implication of the start, but what we did we went in my, by mind that the externalities of the internet of the digital transformation by saying that when you reduce the tax on the digital services, you could let it to expand to other sectors of the economies, which could produce more output and the government could generate more revenue from other sectors, which are much depending on the digital transformation. That is the mind which we went through when we are estimating, when we are doing this study, that when you reduce, for instance, that three, 10 percent tax revenues, it, it means when you expand the internet, it will lead to growth other sectors of the economies, which will become more productive and they consequently raise the revenue from other sectors of the economy. And the government could earn more revenue from other sectors which are much support or depend on the digital in their uses. That is the assumption which you went through about this study. Thank you. And while we have you, Cornell, Sostene Kewe asks, what the implications for monetary policy implementation are from these texts. Is that part of the paper or would that be for another project? No, it's for it another project. Great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Mr. Kewe, that, that can be your next project, um, I would suggest. Stefan, for you, can I put to you a question that Raluca David has put to us? Um, Raluca asks, what are the implications for gender inclusion? If digital taxation does, um, for instance, if digital taxation has detrimental effects on small digital businesses, perhaps that will disproportionately affect female-led businesses. Yeah. Also, women might find it more difficult to navigate the tax bureaucracy, especially in countries with prohibitive gender norms. Did you have a thought on that, Cornell? Is there any evidence on this? Mm, yeah, it's good. That's what you said, as the agenda could raise other sectors, for instance, by gender, as you are saying, could raise the business for women, and as that, you could find that they could expand. That's why we did it by gender, looking that there is gender, even differences in the use of the internet. You find that male are more using internet than the female. And by the study, we found except the Mauritius, where, where they have by almost the same use of the internet, other countries find male are more than using internet compared to female. Thank you. Did you have any thoughts on that, Stefan, or wider reflections from the Digital Pathways Project about the inclusion of women? Yes. Well, well first of all, definitely the, one of the big conclusions of the, of the Pathways Project is that there is a real problem there in the inclusion. And it's an interesting thing. It's that it's not just in terms of having just pure access to the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reports we published with uh, strong input from Benno was also mm -hmm. highlighting, it's also how the difference between how men and women can use the internet. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, um, we, we got, for example, even though there may be an internet connection, most of the time women were still largely using it for basic communication, text messages, where men would be already using more advanced apps. And we were very intrigued by that because it had a mixture to do with that kind of handsets they have access to, but also some of the gender norms of the things they could be doing it in as well. So we, we clearly highlighted that this whole underlying norms issue was also a big thing. So it's not just the financial incentives, but also the norms. So, anyway, so there's definitely something there. 
But it's an interesting thing more on a bigger, bigger scale is that what I liked about seeing the paper, and yes, more could have been done with the paper. And I think, Benno, you're right. You, one, one could think of with this kind of estimations to make a beginning of the kind of overall, simulating the overall tax revenue implications. But what is actually nice is to actually beginning to get some of these basic income and price elasticities, however difficult they may be to estimate with these data. We actually have very little evidence, but the data are coming in. We're getting longer and more data sets for it. So it is an interesting question, not least because some of these data sets can also be uh, split by gender. And so we can actually get in Raluca's question, we can start looking at some of the differential implications of taxation on that in due course. So it, that would be in due course to be done. Since I have the floor just for one moment, I love the idea that, that Shanta is raising, and I think that would be really good relative to, um, in, in terms of the memory of Benno, is that, you know, with the G7 proposals, I, I'm actually going to take this up and I'm actually going to dig out and see whether I can find them. And I, I think actually maybe using the digital pathways and, and people on this call as well, to actually at some point scrutinize these and say, well, how should they be brushed and changed to really be beneficial, more beneficial from an African perspective. I think that would be a, a, a really useful exercise to do. And I think it would, I'm sure it would be welcome uh, also in the, amongst the G7 um, working group uh, people as well. So, so I think it's worth taking this up and, and, and learning more from it. Nari. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. If I can now turn to another former colleague of Benno's, Anupam Khanna, who has a question. Anupam, welcome. Uh, you're on mute, so if you could come off mute to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, great to see all of you and uh, great to be able to participate in this. I've, of course, been following the work of Digital Pathways uh, since its inception and have been in touch with uh, Stefan. I won't take too much of your time. I have been a long-term uh, evangelist for reducing telecom and actually digital technology costs for uh, people in general, for the public at large and poor people in particular, especially in Africa and in India. A long time ago, in fact, even before this revolution, I remember doing projects in Kenya and Nigeria where we, I thought the telecom costs were just too high and there were ways of doing it. However, I'm a little more careful now after seeing the finances of telecom companies and the sector and sort of having looked at the supply chains, uh, looking at and gotten into arguments about uh, auctions and so on. Very similar arguments are made that we should not have auctions because they lead to price, high prices for the poor and impact affordability. I find those arguments to be specious. And there are ways I think we can reduce prices and uh, without adversely impacting government revenue. And let's not face it, governments in all over the world are highly strapped, forgetting you. about is issues of efficiency. So that's my caution. Thank I'm sure Benno has done a very detailed and thorough analysis. So I look and read this paper with keen, keen interest. Thank you. A Thank you, Anupam. A great comment to remember the significant rents at stake here. I've now, I'd now like to call upon a very dear friend of um, Professor Ndulu's, but also Tanzania's representative in the United Kingdom, Ambassador Amin Pungwe. Welcome. And I, I understand you have a comment to make and we'd, we'd welcome it. Ambassador. I know you've just given me a, a new job. Uh, I retired 22 years ago. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody would appoint me ambassador at this age. But certainly, uh, uh, I should start by, by thanking you and your colleagues for holding this uh, memorial uh, seminar on, uh, on Benno. And I, I believe uh, Benno's daughter is in the audience, Dulika. She should also appreciate to see uh, Benno's colleagues uh, honoring him in this way. Certainly, uh, yeah, you are right on that part that uh, Ben and I grew up together. And um, although we took separate uh, uh, routes in our careers, but uh, we, we used to meet from time to time and uh, exchange views. And particularly, 
after my retirement and his retirement from the Bank of Tanzania, we used to spend a lot of time on the digital transformation and the work he was doing with the pathways. And uh, uh, I was privileged to get the, the report much earlier as it came out. So uh, it helps me in my retirement. I'm spending a lot of time reading about the future. So Ben was very much committed. And uh, I remember having a discussion with him after his retirement that uh, I reminded him that uh, I was sitting on a board of a bank in Tanzania, but uh, at the same time, I was a chairman of a telco company in Tanzania. As a, a director of a board, uh, of a commercial bank board, I told Benno that uh, I saw him as uh, he sold us out uh, because he allowed uh, mobile uh, financial transactions to, to be operated by non-bankers. Mm -hmm. But as a but as a chairman of a telco, I saw him as a hero <laughs> uh, by allowing us, you know, the telco companies to be involved in uh, mobile financial transactions. So I asked Beno, how did you manage to strike a balance? You are a regulator of, uh, of, uh, of, of bank, and yet you allowed uh, uh, telcos to operate in your space. And he said, I mean, look here, my, as, a, as a governor of the central bank, my preoccupation is uh, financial inclusion and deepening. Uh, for you guys in the commercial banking, uh, uh, banking industry, you have been in Tanzania for 100 years, and yet you have only reached 15%. But at the same time, I saw this technology by telcos, you know, which is uh, moving me much faster, already taken me to 26%. And therefore, I decided to embrace it, but uh, uh, not to become a harsh regulator and say, stop this and stop that, don't do that. I decided to allow the technology to operate and learn from the trends and then regulate around its, 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 its trends and direction. And in this way, Tanzania today, in terms of uh, mobile financial transactions, I think we are one of the leading in the world. And that is, it was Ben Ndulu. So it was not just theorizing or uh, as an academic uh, 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 paper writer, he, he practiced it and he, with conviction. And I, I say this because we've been di discussing a lot. So Thank you. I, made, I made a comment quickly, maybe I, I should, uh, we are, we're having this as, a, a, as an issue taxation because in Africa, most, most African government have not embraced the fourth industrial revolution, which is driving this digi digital transformation. Because once you, you embrace that, then the question of, uh, of taxation no longer becomes an issue because, uh, uh, because taxation should not be taken as a, a revenue collection exercise. Mm -hmm. Taxation is, should be taken as a a policy or strategy execution exercise. And once you're uh, you have a conviction about fourth industrial revolution, about digital transformation, and what it can do to, to, to liberate your economy, then the issue of uh, going slow and soft on taxation becomes easier. But if you have not embraced that, then it becomes a difficult issue. And that's why we are having a, this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ami Mpungwe. It's wonderful to hear your ringside view of the transformation Beno Ndulu brought about as governor, bringing about the transformation of banking by opening up tele telecoms, which took courage and innovation okay. to do. And you watched that from firsthand and reminding us of his view shared by you that taxation is how you execute strategy. It's not a policy in and of itself. Thank you. That's um, really important to underline. I'd like now to bring in another Pathways Commissioner who sat on the commission with uh, Ben Ondulu, Kamal Bhattacharya. Actually, just before I do, I would like to pick up on something else I mean Pungwe noted to us and say a very special welcome to today's seminar to Ndulika Ndulu. We are thrilled to be honoring your father's research. We're much inspired by not just his research, but by him as a person. And I'm so pleased that you are able to be with us here today. Um, and now Kamal Bhattacharya, I'd like to turn the floor to you for your comment um, as a fellow 
Pathways Commissioner with Benno. Uh, first, thank you so much. And um, yeah. Uh, sorry, you're on mute now, Kamal. You've gone on to mute for some reason. Could you unmute yourself? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect, sorry. Uh, first of all, Professor Woods and also Stefan and others, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I just wanted to share, you know, I, I had heard of uh, Benno way before I met him for the first time uh, because, you know, I used to spend a lot of my time working on sort of more on the technology side of mobile money and, you know, given that Benno was sort of a revolutionary in the space. When I met him for the first time, I could not put that very humble and very kind individual who spent you know, a lot of time talking to me about stuff that I was interested in together with sort of the, the little bit of hero worship we had in Kenya um, because uh, he had done the kind of things that uh, despite all the efforts that were going on in the mobile money space in Kenya, the government had actually not been able to do, especially in terms of interoperability, uh, which I thought was a very important aspect in this whole space. Um, and uh, I just wanted to just take this opportunity also to share uh, what a wonderful person he was. And I have learned so much from him in the engagements that I had with him. Uh, he is just kind, and I was so shocked to hear about his uh, passing. Um, and I, um, Cornell and Stefan, thanks for presenting this paper. Um, I've already downloaded it. I'm definitely going to look more into it. And I just wanted to raise this question uh, that I had, um, and Stefan, you alluded a little bit to this. Yeah, you, you know, I, uh, having moved back to the EU, um, and uh, being a citizen of Germany, I do feel very strongly about that a lot of the, uh, these big questions, whether it is on carbon emissions, whether it is on, uh, on, on digitization, a lot of the leadership has to come from here. Um, and it's not coming from here. The freemium model of the internet uh, was actually something that I had discussed with uh, Benno uh, in one of our last uh, get togethers in Kenya. And um, what I thought was there is an interesting opportunity for innovation that I wanna encourage you to bring out because it's not that easy to do, but if you could do it, the EU is a great place to start with it because the, the pandemic has shown that a lot of children who live in poverty here are actually disenfranchised as all the education has moved online. Uh, I've seen this here in my neighborhood quite dramatically, actually, and I've been helping on some of the fronts here myself. And if we can take some of these ideas and actually experiment with this here, um, both from the deep technology side that I think is required, but also especially from the policy recommendations um, that, that the two of you presented today, uh, I think that could be such a revolutionary and groundbreaking things to do that we can then apply in many different ways in, um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Thank you, Kamal Bhattacharya. Thank you for that, th those thoughts for the project. I'm going to turn now, um, before we close, to um, someone who's known uh, Benno Ndulu longer than almost any of us here for um, a closing thought. And ju just, and that is Professor Paul Collier. Just before I do, I would like to just ask um, Stefan um, and Cornell, was there anything final that you needed to say in response to those questions? I'll assume there isn't, unless I hear you jump forward. I'll jump forward just to give them the courtesy. And, and with Kamal on the freemium model, I totally agree. I see a lot of policy responses that focus again on the hardware, but actually it's the data, the access to data where a freemium model is really useful, including in the UK, including in Europe. And so I agree with you, there's something there really there in it. And I just want to pick up on one comment in the, in the text, in the, in the chat, where where it, it is suggested, well, are we now really saying that, um, you know, billions are being made by these tech companies? Are we just trying to say we shouldn't be taxing it? We should just share the revenue with it. And it came in the, in the text and in, 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 in the chat. And it's actually really interesting. Benno never said, oh, no, we're not going to try to tax it. 
he wanted to make sure that we get a structure of taxation that is not distortionary, that doesn't stifle the small businesses that want to start using data or the, the, the entrepreneurs or the female entrepreneurs that wanted to make use of these things to actually being uh, overtaxed relative to other things. So it's about the distortion and the regressiveness of the taxation, not that he didn't want any taxation. And I think that's, that's probably what I like most about the paper also when I saw it, is that he was trying to get, you know, it's, it's not about tax or not, it's about fair taxation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you very much for, for bringing me in. Um, it's been a wonderful occasion. Um, it's a memorial. And so naturally, in a memorial, we look back at a life. But actually, what Benno would most have wanted us to do was look forward to the future. And it's no surprise, it's a very fitting um, uh, enter Benno's active work that this last paper should have been with Cornell. Um, uh, I wrote work with Benno an awful long time ago, Cornell. So um, it's very fitting that you are the, the person of the future that he's now, that he was still writing. Now, um, there are two respects in which we need to look forward to the future with Benno, because there are two routes through which he's going to leave an impact on the future. And one is in the domain of ideas. And let me just put that in perspective. Um, if we turn to the greatest economist of the 20th century, Keynes, um, his biggest impact of his ideas were some 60 years after his death in 2009, when we had a global recession and nobody knew what to do, and the economics of the time turned out to be completely useless. And what did people do? They very rapidly retreated to Keynes. Now, we faced with a really important new problem, this digital divide. And I would say, first of all, that the digital divide is not unique to Africa. Uh, in Britain, we've got an acute digital divide, both a spatial digi digital divide and a class digital divide. Um, I just got off a, a Zoom with uh, Bristol where they were terribly worried, the education department in Bristol, terribly worried at the poorer part of their population had discovered that kids had no access uh, to the internet just when they needed it. Um, the same is true of America. And so this concept of premium taxation can actually be an idea of the future which actually unites Africa and a lot of Western societies, which all face to different degrees this same problem. And having a structure of taxation, which actually encourages the, 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 the stuff that isn't fancy, that is actually essential for activity, but then really milks uh, the premium stuff, um, uh, which people um, like uh, myself, Stefan, um, and Nairi, um, find we have to get. Um, so there's a legacy idea who, who, which is going to have its impact not in the past but in the future. Um, and my two penneth of suggestion um, for how to transmit it is not just G7, get it to the tax unit of the OECD. The tax unit of the OECD will be desperately trying to find something to bring together America and Europe, and this can be it. Um, but there's another respect in which the greatest people um, have an impact on the future. Uh, and that, in Benno's case, applies. It's character. It's a person whose behavior is a role model that can inspire people in the next generation and indeed for some generations to come. And that is because Benno is such a person because he was a wonderful man. He was a human being, as well as a person clever with ideas. And I'm going to finish with one little anecdote, which sort of illustrates that. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, we were both at the World Bank. Um, and uh, I brought my little three-year-old in, um, just about when I was leaving. And, uh, and Benno um, spotted him on his own and went up to him and knelt down and started to talk to, to, to Danny 
in his own terms, at Danny's own level, in every sense. What was Danny really interested in? It turned out what Danny was really interested in age three was trains. And then come Christmas time, when I was flying back to England to spend Christmas with Danny and my family, um, Benno presented me with a huge box, which I only just managed to get on the plane. Um, and at the other end, I unpacked it, and it was a Christmas present for, for Danny. And when he unwrapped it on Christmas Day, Danny literally jumped for joy. And ever since then, um, he's been, uh, he's hero worshipped Benno. When I told Danny of Benno's death, he was deeply saddened. So Benno can live in the future, both as a role model for people like Cornell uh, and for ideas um, that will live on uh, and could be really, really useful in the coming discussions on how to tax uh, the internet without killing the goose. But on that note, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you again to Ndulika Ndulu. We're so pleased to have you here as we remember your father who touched everyone, every one of us in a very special way. He's been described today with astonishment at how anyone who, could, who was so thoughtful and quiet and humble and kind and observing of others could at the same time be such a brilliant revolutionary hero worshipped um, and truly a man who shaped both the times he lived in and the times ahead of us as Paul just underlined. Thank you all for joining us for this memorial seminar to Benno and I want to say on all of our behalfs a very special thanks to Elizabeth Stewart the executive director of the Digital Pathways Project who's done so much with her wonderful team to bring this event together today and thank you to Stefan Dercon and to Cornell for their wonderful, to Cornell Joseph, for their wonderful presentation of um, Benno's uh, last paper. We were so honored to have him as part of our community. We know that each person, each one of you was honored to have Benno as part of your life and your way of thinking. And we will all take it forward with us to fashion a better future. Thank you all so much for joining us today.